Well, let's open up our Bibles once again to the book of Matthew. As we make our way verse by verse through the New Testament, we find ourselves here now at the final verses of what we know as the, uh, the Olivet Discourse. This is on Tuesday of Passion Week. Tuesday has been a very long day, hasn't it? We've been in Tuesday now for a number of chapters. But now, at the end of uh, chapter 25, uh, Jesus is wrapping all of this up. And you remember that all of this is the result of the disciples asking him, hey, when's the end? How's, how's the end going to roll out? What is the sign that we should be looking for? Now, Jesus has said a number of things. And you remember in verse 21 of chapter 24 that he said, for that will be a time of greater horror than anything that the world has ever seen or will ever see again. Now, again, we've got wonderful brothers and sisters in Christ that would tell us, well, this is spiritual language. He is not saying something that should be taken literally. Well, if you don't take this literally, I mean, what is he saying? What is the spiritual application, right? Because how does he follow it up in verse 22? He goes on to say, in fact, unless that time of calamity is shortened, the entire human race will be destroyed, but it will be shortened for the sake of God's chosen ones. Now, if you came up to me and you said, well, what do you think the future holds? And I say to you, I'll tell you what the future is going to bring. We're going to have something the world's never seen before. It's going to be so bad. Nobody's ever seen anything like this, and nobody is ever going to see anything like it ever again. In fact, if God does not shorten it, no life would remain on the planet. Now, would you walk away wondering, gee, I wonder what he meant. I wonder what he was saying. I mean, if you're going to say this is spiritual language, if this is not to be taken literally, then what in the world is he trying to communicate to us? Now, all Jesus is doing is reiterating what the prophets have already told us. In Jeremiah, Jeremiah put it this way, in all history, there has never been such a time of terror. It will be a time of trouble for my people Israel, and yet in the end, they will be saved. Daniel said it this way in Daniel chapter 12. At that time, shall Michael stand up, the great prince which stands for the children. Notice now, second time that we've got here, uh, thy people. Uh, that, that he says, now, thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. All right, so there is, again, a time of trouble. The world has never seen anything like this before. But yet, in the end, the Lord's people are going to be left standing. Now, Jesus is going to go into this a little bit more as we begin in verse 31. Now, when we think of this time of trouble, how long is this time of trouble uh, going to last? And we find over and over again, uh, this antichrist, this son of perdition, this beast, whatever title you want to use for this cat, this guy is going to be in power for 1,260 days. Sometimes the Bible uses the time frame of 42 months. Sometimes it uses the time frame of three and a half years. Sometimes it uses the time frame of 1,260 days. Now, let's say that you're really with it and you're paying attention to circumstances around the world, and you see some crazy stuff beginning to develop on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, and you think to yourself, I'm getting out of Dodge, and so you got your bug out bag, and you got your AK and your ARs, and you've got 10,000 rounds of ammo, and you put it in your trunk, and, and you're gonna go now to this uh, isolated cabin in the Rocky Mountains where you've got uh, freeze-dried roast beef and all kinds of stuff there, and you're going to hole up uh, for three and a half years. And after three and a half years, you reemerge. You are unscathed. You have made it through this tribulation period. Now, again, remember that not everybody is killed in the tribulation. We've got this idea that the whole world is wiped out. 
Now, you look at the numbers, the book of Revelation, you look at what Christ said concerning just as the days of Noah, you're looking about half of the world's population. And so half of the world's population is probably going to make it through this terrible time of, of terror. But you're not out of the woods yet. Because Daniel says this in chapter 12. He said, now blessed is he who waits and arrives at the 1,335 days. So we've got 75 extra days. So you make it, you make it through three and a half years. Yay, good for you. You made it. But again, now if you really want to be blessed, you got to make it for 75 more days. Now, what in the world is going on in those 75 days? Now, I cannot be dogmatic about this, but it does seem reasonable to me that the events that Jesus now describes beginning in verse 31 would be a reasonable thing to assume that what he's describing here will take these 75 days and those people that make it through this 75 day process that they will be given permission to enter into what we call the millennial kingdom. Now please understand in the millennial kingdom there is still sin In the millennial kingdom, people are still going to die, right? And so here we have a group of people who I don't believe are Christians who are going to be given the unique blessing of entering in to the kingdom, the earthly kingdom of Christ for a period of a thousand years. Now let's look at how all of this rolls out, beginning in verse 31, where Jesus says, now, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all of the holy angels with him, then he will sit on his throne or on the throne of his glory. All of the nations are going to be gathered before him and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he will set the sheep on his right hand, but he will put the goats uh, on his left. So Jesus now is described as coming with uh, an untold number of spiritual beings. These angels are coming with him. And what is the role that these angels will be fulfilling? We don't have to really guess at this because Paul tells us in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 that he will come with his mighty angels in flaming fire, bringing judgment on those who do not know God and on those who refuse to obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. Now, these angels are used in the process of judging mankind. Now, he tells us in verse 32 that the nations are going to be gathered. All of the nations are going to be gathered, and they're going to be separated. And no doubt, these spiritual beings are going to be a part of this process of the judgment of of the nations. Now, where is this judgment going to take place? Is it going to happen in New York? Is it going to happen in London, Berlin, Beijing, Sydney? Where in the world will all of this take place? Now, we don't have to guess once again because the prophet Joel reveals this to us. In Joel chapter 3, he says this, I will gather, I will also gather all nations and I will bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. And I will enter into judgment with them there on account of my people, my heritage, Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations. They've done two things. They've scattered his people. And then watch out, United Nations, they have also divided my land. All right, now where is the valley of Jehoshaphat? If you take and Google Earth, Jerusalem, you've got Jerusalem here on the left. You've got the Mount of Olives on the right. Now, on the Mount of Olives, this is where Jesus is currently speaking in Matthew 24 and Matthew 25. And you'll notice you've got this anomaly that's kind of a serpentine brown area going in between. This is the valley of Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat means God will judge. And so this is an appropriate place for God to judge the nations. Now, notice the basis of the judgment that he uses here in verse 34. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, come, you blessed of the father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation 
of the world. For, now this is a reason why they're being blessed, I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. And then the righteous, they will answer him and say, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and gave you drink? When did we see you as a stranger and take you in or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and came unto you? And Jesus, the king, rather, will answer and say unto them, Assuredly, I say unto you, inasmuch as that you have done it to one of the least of these my brethren, uh, you did it uh, unto me. All right, so this is kind of the mother, if you will, of all Nuremberg trials. And so Christ now says to those on his right, Right, you have, you've shown kindness to me, and now therefore you're able to enter into the kingdom. Now, the fact that these people are totally blindsided by this, you get the impression nobody here in this crowd knows what's going on. Now, I would imagine you don't have to be in the church very long until you hear the concept Inasmuch as that you've done it unto one of the least of these, you've done it unto me. I mean, this is kind of Christianity 101. I mean, every, even, even a, a, a baby Christian knows this kind of terminology out of the Bible. The fact that these guys act like they have never heard anything like this before, it sort of tips their hand for me to say, well, these are not Christians. These are not people who have a relationship uh, with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Jesus says unto them that you have shown kindness, and I notice the term that he uses there, uh, uh, for my brethren. Now, that word in the Greek, it means of the same womb, it means of the same blood. He is obviously referring uh, to the physical line of Abraham. Jesus was a physical descendant of Abraham, but I also believe that it is referring to the church. And the reason why I say this is because you remember back in chapter 12 of Matthew, uh, Jesus had somebody come into the house and say, hey, your, your brothers and your mom, they're out there. They, they want to talk to you. And Jesus say, hey, who, who, is, who is my mom? Who, who, who is my, my family members? And then Jesus answers the question, and he said, for whoever shall do the will of my Father which is in heaven, the same is my brother and sister and mother. Who is my family? My family are those who follow the will of God. Now, what is the will of God? It is the will of God that none should perish but that all should come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. The moment that you and I bowed the knee to Christ, the moment that we receive the gift of eternal life, at that very moment, you and I were translated from being a child of wrath, even as others, to becoming an adopted son and daughter of God. In John chapter 1, He tells us, as many as received him, received Christ, to those he gave the legal right to be called the children of God. The Lord is holding out to each and every one of us the gift of life. There is no reason why anybody should ever perish. The gospel is easy. Salvation is easy. He's holding out a gift to you, and he is saying, I have done everything, but I do not make that final decision. I will not violate your free will. Receive the gift of God. I'll never forget the night that I received the gift of God. I remember the night I heard it for the first time that I could be forgiven. I thought that myself and my family a bunch of drunken rednecks. We deserved hell. I had no argument with the concept of hell at all. What I didn't know is that there was a fix, 
And the fix was just putting my trust in Christ. And the joy that overcame me when I knew that my sins were forgiven. And listen to me. If you do not have the assurance of salvation, I will give you an opportunity to experience that same joy before you leave here today that your sins can be forgiven and you can be translated into the family of God. Now, Isaiah tells us this in Isaiah 66. He says, for as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make shall remain before me, says the Lord, so shall your descendants, Isaiah's descendants, and and your name uh, remain. That the, the remnant of Israel and the church is not going to be extinguished. We will be standing in the end. Now, there are these people that have this concept that, well, things are getting better and better. The church is getting stronger and stronger. It is only a matter of time before we're going to take over the world and we're going to Christianize the world and it's going to be a kumbaya moment and we're all, as, as a global society, we are all going to be the worshipers of Christ. And what we have to understand is that the church of Jesus Christ is getting the snot kicked out of her all around the world. Now here are unbelievers being rewarded by Christ because of the kindness that they have shown to the Lord's people. Now if the Lord expects that from unbelievers, how much more does he expect the same behavior from you and I? What kind of a concern should we have for the global church and relieving the pressure that is on some of our brothers and sisters in Christ. We live in a bubble here in the United States. We think this is the way it is around the world, and it is not. You think the church is taking over, really? Let me buy you an airline ticket to Tehran. And you get off that plane and you stand on a busy street corner and you boldly proclaim Jesus Christ and you see what happens to you. You will have a quick education that the church is indeed not taking over. Or sneak into North Korea. That's a great idea. Sneak in there. Preach Christ on a street corner somewhere and see how rapidly you are thrown in prison or worse. Go to the Sudan. Go to Eritrea. Go to Pakistan. And now we see Christian persecution uh, certainly on the rise in India now. All around the world, the world hates God. And the world cannot punch God in the face but it can punch you in the face. And you and I are the representatives of him. And this Christian persecution is growing around the world. Even Newsweek, even Newsweek admits this. The persecution of Christians across the world is fast becoming genocide and that the faith will soon disappear in some areas of the world, even in locations where its pre presence dates back to antiquity. A genocide Watch tells us since the year 2000, 62,000 Christians in Nigeria have been murdered in genocide perpetrated by Islamic jihadist groups. You know, the, the peace-loving Muslims, you know, the, the people that love peace, right? They've, they've just killed 62,000 of us since the year 2000. The Christian Post reports this, more than 16 thousand Christians were killed in Nigeria in four years between 2019 and 2023 as more followers of Christ were victims of violence than adherents of other religions. Even the UK parliament tells us this, around 365 million Christians are subject to high levels of persecution and discrimination. This compares to 340 million in 2021. So in three years, uh, we, we have had uh, 25 million Christians uh, added to that list. Now, do, do you care? Do you care? Do you have a, a, a desire? Does this, does this bug you? you know, I've, I've got a list of things that bug me. I'm sure you've got a list of things that bug you, right? And we are adding to that list every single day of our life, aren't we? And, and so when it comes to Christian persecution, is it anywhere on the list? Is it anywhere on your list 
that you care at all. There are things happening to our sisters in Christ I can't even begin to describe for you that's taking place in some of these pockets in Africa. It is an abomination. It is atrocious. But do we care? David Curry, writing in USA Today, says this, the leadership of the American church with its super pastors and mega churches is whistling through the graveyard. The church relies on positivity to attract donors to sustain large budgets, leaves no room for pastors to talk about the suffering of Christians. Like the culture, the American church is more concerned about college entrance scandals and Game of Thrones than persecution. Inoculated by entertainment and self-absorption, they are completely detached from the experience of the global church. The American church is feeding itself to death why the worldwide church is being murdered. And so Jesus says to these unbelievers, I so appreciate. Now, again, if you had a child that was under the gun, you had a child that was in, in a very desperate uh, place in their life and, and a stranger came up to them and helped them and gave them love, would you not, as the parent, feel greatly compelled to bless them, oh, thank you so much for what you did uh, to my child. And that's what's, that's what's going on here, that the Lord is saying to these guys, you have been a blessing to my people, and therefore now I'm going to bless you. Now notice, notice what he says now in verse 41, as all of this judgment comes to an end. He says, then... They will also say, then he will also say to those on his left, now you depart from me, you cursed, and, um, and, and, you, and, and uh, assuredly, I, uh, whoa, I'm all mixed up, aren't I? Verse 41, and into the everlasting fire uh, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was thirsty, and you gave me no food, or I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not take me in. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick, and in prison, and you did not visit me. And then and they will also answer him saying, Lord, well, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? And then he will answer them saying, assuredly, I say unto you, inasmuch as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And then the unfortunate judgment, and these will go away into everlasting judgment, punishment, but the righteous shall go into eternal life, right? Now, again, if God expected this kind of behavior from unbelievers, how much of this kind of behavior does he expect from you and, and I? Now, at the end of time, and Jesus now has given us several of these moments in the book of Matthew, that at the end of time there is a sorting, there is a division at the end of time. He talked about a division between the wheat and the tares. He talked about the division of the fish, if you remember that story. He talks now about the division between the sheep and the goats. That is what is in earth's future. There is a sorting that will take place. And that sorting will be the difference between life and death. Now hear me. You search your own heart. You judge your own heart. I'm not judging anybody. You search your heart and you ask yourself, do you have an authentic relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ? Eternal life is based upon a relationship with Christ. It's not based upon you being a churchy person and being here at church every time the doors are open or giving large sums of money to the church or going on mission trips. Salvation is based in Christ alone. Just as the Philippian jailer asked the Apostle Paul, what do I have to do to be saved? Paul's answer was, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved 
And I ask you, as I ask you every single week, are you saved? And I want you to understand that the, the gospel is put in terms as being simple. And it is as simple as you simply turning. You turn. That's what repentance means. There's a change of heart that brings about a change of direction. I'm no longer running away from God, but I'm running towards God. I'm turning to him and I'm giving him my face. Now, I ask you, do you want salvation? Do you want eternal life? I want to give you an opportunity to receive eternal life. He that has a son has life. He that has not the son of God does not have life. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody gets to the Father but by me. Jesus is offering himself to you. And I know what I ask you to do is difficult, but I do believe that it has great value. You're here you want to be made right with the Lord. You want to know that your sins and your iniquities are forgiven. I simply ask that you raise your hand and I'm going to pray for you. Is there anybody here this morning? You want to say, yes, please pray for me. I, I want the Lord. I want to leave this place knowing that I am right with God. Today is a day of salvation. Is there anybody here? You want to say yes to the Lord. Now for those of us who are the followers of Christ. Now, we began back in chapter 24, verse 24, where Jesus was talking about how you weather the storm of the last days. Three weeks ago, we talked about be ready, be ready. Head up, rifle up, understand, walk circumspectly. Don't live your life as a fool, but understand what, what the culture is, what the time is that we live in. Two weeks ago, we talked about you need to have a relationship with the Holy Spirit. Last week, we talked about you need to live like Jesus Christ is Lord. And now today, you need to have a genuine care for one another. Now, we all sense what's going on in the culture. How long is it going to be before free speech is taken away from us? How long is it going to be before the FBI is finally fully weaponized and shuts down all pro-life believers. How long is it gonna be before we can no longer meet at 1001 West Wallen Road and we have to shutter this place? Do you have a community? Do you have a home group? Do you have a community group? Do you have a home Bible study? Do you have a network of other believers? And if you don't, then how in the world do you expect to survive? You're, you're not going to survive as a lone ranger. You need brothers and sisters that you can depend upon. You need brothers and sisters that you are showing kindness to. What does it mean to show kindness? The 10 rules for showing kindness. You go out, do something for somebody else, and then you repeat that nine times, All right? That is your calling. Do something for other people. Quit sucking the oxygen out of the, out of the air. Quit, quit pouring everything that you have into the sands of self. God expects you to be your brother and sister's keeper. Who are you keeping? Who are you helping? Who are you demonstrating kindness to? I heard Kirk Cameron on the uh, Unashamed podcast this week. He said, but despite the fact that we have been filled with and empowered by the Holy Spirit, today's Christians are so scared and depressed by the giants in our land. What do giants look like today? Big tech. Big government, big pharma, big business. Now we have Christians sitting on their couch, watching Fox News, crying in their Chick-fil-A soup, praying for the rapture. That is not the will of God for your life. Jesus said, you occupy until I come. You do business until I come. You spread the fragrance of Jesus Christ everywhere you go. What did Christ do? Everywhere he went, he went about doing good. We need to take a page out of John Wesley's book. He said, do all the good you can, by all the means you can, in all of the ways you can, in all of the places you can, at all of the times you can, to all of the people you can, as long as you can. Lord, put me in the game. 
Lord, use my life. Help me to have a genuine concern about the things that concern you. Lord, if it bugs you, I want it to bug me. If it bothers you, I want it to bother me. I don't want to live my life taking up space. I want to live my life full on for the Lord Jesus Christ being his ambassador to a dying and lost world. Oh, let's pray that God would fill us afresh with his spirit and we would be used to transform the culture around us. Father, we thank you for your wonderful love. Lord, I, I cannot express to you enough how we appreciate in the fullness of time you sent forth the Lord Jesus Christ. I can't thank you enough that not only have you forgiven me my sin before I was a Christian, but Lord, you have forgiven me since I've been a Christian. Father, I think of the amount of mercy that has been poured out in my life. And Lord, as we sang, a thousand hallelujahs and a thousand more. And Lord, may each of us have an understanding of what Christ has done for us. And Lord, would you, would your love compel us this week to live full on for your glory. Lord, give us a vision. Give us a vision. Give us an understanding of what it is you're seeking to do in and through us. Help us, Father, to be bothered by what bothers you. For we ask these things in Jesus' name, amen.